This one's called Why Rachel Wants to Climb the Tower. I hate her. I'm honestly, I don't even want to watch this video. I hate you, Rachel. Rachel, Rachel, do you actually like Rachel? If you're a, if you're a webtoon reader, then maybe you have reason to like Rachel because you're probably so ahead. It's like, oh, just trust, bro. She just changes and crazy character development for her. But if an anime only right now likes Rachel, it truly is telling of the kind of person you are. And I don't have to describe it. You already know what kind of person you are. Anyways, let's check out this cut content. What started? Started out as a fairly faithful adaptation is now rapidly turning into a very rushed story. Okay. Don't get me wrong though, the anime is still doing a great job of highlighting the most important plot points. But what makes Tower of God such a popular series is all the little details that go into building this complex world. The world building. And if season 1 of the anime plans on covering all 80 chapters of season 1 of the webtoon then I think we're gonna start seeing a lot more changes. Okay. So let's continue our cut content series and take a look at all those small details and skipped scenes that we missed out on. But before we get started, but first... Now, before we get into episode 6, there was a couple changes made at the end of episode 5 that are- Oh, you got me! No sponsored ad, but, uh, you know, he, the, 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 the transition scene was, uh, the transition scene was that. Um, I, I'm hovering over the timeline here, and I see um, a name for red hair girl. Now, a name being spoiled I don't think matters, but her identity being spoiled does actually matter. Should I keep watching this? Like, we are in episode 9 right now because we need to be ahead of cut content series because any news likes to spoil a shitload in these cut content. But we're three episodes ahead. Surely we can watch this, right? They're worth mentioning. First was the reason the crown game had no winner. Contrary to what the anime said, the crown itself was never destroyed. The mysterious team of outsiders had every opportunity to grab it for themselves. They just chose not to. Instead, they decided to stay on the floor of test. It was all going as how you had planned. The test wasn't intended to advance this powerful trio ahead of the rest. It was intended to determine the power and potential of those who could bring harm to the tower. Or at least that's what he wanted Lidodo to think. Cap, smuggling, bombing, that's a bullshit excuse. That's the most bullshit excuse of like, of why you would want this person here. It's like, like why would you, what kind of fucking logic is that? It's like, okay, I think they're bad. I think you're regular bad. We need to kick him out right now. And he's like, no, 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 no. We need to make sure they come in so we can monitor them. That's our job, right? It's like, what are you fucking talking about? You was well aware that bomb was the most dangerous regular on the second floor. You was aware. You Han Sung. It's, you couldn't say Han Sung, but saying you was aware is pretty funny. And he knew that Little Do was also coming towards that same conclusion. So you made it seem as if sending Rachel to stop Bob so was you his made plan a scene. the entire time. You. Though SIU makes it clear in his notes that you is planning something a little bit shady. SIU makes it clear that you is planning. Who? <laughs> you? Am I you? You are me? Am I, I am you? Here than that. Another thing that SIU notes at the end of this arc is that Hua Ryun is the most beautiful out of the second floor regular. Hua Ryun. But there's no way an English speaking person that doesn't know Korean would read this and pronounce it run. You're, it, it's impossible. It's just, uh, again, just language translation difficulties. Though I personally disagree, I guess we now know who the author's current best girl is. I think that Hua Ryun is. Maybe more attractive than Endorsey. I don't know. Endorsey, medium hairstyle. It's it's long hair versus medium hair. Uh, I like long hair more. Endorsey is great. Uh, but Huarian right now seems a bit more mysterious, and I I'm just gonna go with her instead. Healers. Though I personally disagree, I guess we now know who the author's current best girl is. Anyway, now we can get into episode six. Okay. Position selection, covering chapter twenty eight to chapter thirty four of the webtoon. We open with a flashback of one of Bomb's memories where Rachel is telling him stories about the sky. Rachel wanted to know if Bomb knew what was at the top of the tower, but Bomb didn't seem to care that much. He possessed the exact opposite mindset of Rachel. So as they lay down and imagined the real night sky above them, Rachel says a line that may not seem significant now but bears a lot of meaning later. Like what? She says it's not the night that we're afraid of. It's the beautiful night. The real night. What's even more significant than this night. though is that they're lying on the edge of a cliff where on the walls above is a giant engraving of the Crimson Three Eyes, Zahad. the symbol of the Zahad family. 
giving us our first clue as to where Bama and Rachel could have come from. As what the fuck? That's related to Zahai? I don't even know where we're at, but this is outside the tower, not even middle inner outer layer. It's just like completely outside a tower and you're near Zahad markings. We now know that it's somewhere that could potentially be related to the royal family. Interesting. Switching back to the present. Bam is a secret royal prince of Zahad. That's an irregular. Rachel's a secret fucking Zahad daughter. Does Zahad even have daughters? He just poaches daughters from other strong families and makes them Zahad princess. Do we have any relations? I don't know now. Kun was a lot less hostile when he was talking to Rachel. In fact, he seemed rather friendly. Instead of coldly cutting right to the chase, Kun let Rachel talk all about how her past was with Bum. She painted a picture of the two of them being very close, but that just went to make it even more so- <laughs> this, this art is crazy. Ha, is that really our Kun, bro? Is that, is that really him? That's insane. That's, that's, that's wild. Surprising when Rachel said it wasn't possible for her to stay with him. Kun couldn't understand what it is that Rachel wanted that was so important for her to just give up Bum. It's not like she didn't care for him though. Rachel does want to be with Bum. It's the reason that she chose to give up the crown and stay on this floor. But it's as if she has some unexplained reason of why she can't be with him. It's not that she doesn't like him. It's like... He cannot exist on the path I'm walking to for the sake of my goals no matter what. And that I don't know why. Like, why can't you do it with him? He is fucking cracked. He's, he's the main character of the show. Surely climbing the tower with Bob is gonna be the easiest way forward. But she tries everything she can to get away from him. Because she doesn't want to get him involved in the dangers. I don't fucking know. This, this is the thing that's really frustrating. But the stars have and always will be her dream. She then tells Kun all about the fabled stars at the top of the tower. Ever since Rachel heard the Babel. legend herself, all Babel. she could dream of was the vision of one day staring into the endless night sky. It became such a beautiful and overwhelming thought that every time it came to mind, her heart would beat out of her chest. Even now, when she closes her eyes, all she can see is the blinding light of the stars. Why? It's these thoughts and what does that, matter? that have led her to make reaching the top of the tower her one and only goal. Now, we don't know for sure whether that reason was enough to convince Kun to go along with her plan. But it definitely wasn't because he didn't want to let Bam near Rachel. I mean, Kun didn't seem the least bit concerned with Rachel's character. Sorry, the Kun there is just too funny. I don't know, I just... Why does the stars matter so much? Is it, is it just as simple as I've been stuck forever underground so I want to see the stars? It's just like a symbolic thing. There's nothing material gain you get from the stars. You just, I want to see something different. So I want to climb this tower no matter what. But while doing so, I'm going to abandon Bum because he can't exist. Why? I don't fucking know. She seemed kind of jealous in the episodes though, right? She seemed very jealous of Bum and like there was a scene where there was like a sunny side and like a dark side. And like Bomb and Rachel are like opposed. And Bomb has a bunch of friends that keep appearing on the sunny side. And Rachel's alone in the dark side. Which implies that she is jealous of Bomb and that's why she doesn't like him. I don't fucking know. It just upsets me that nothing is being explained. So I wonder why in the anime they decided to make it seem that way. Next we get to the scene where Anak tries to get Shibisu to talk to the Black March. As Anak was leaving, that's when we see Serena now entering. Drunk. Apparently, Shibisu and Serena were close enough friends to have drinks with each other. Oh. So clearly there was no They're hard drinks after the crown game. After this, we have the scene with Anak and Endodice. As we saw, Endodice wanted to make it very clear who the Black March belonged to. As a result, we Yuri. get to learn a bit more about Yuri herself. After becoming a ranker, it took less than 100 years for her to become a high ranker. Wait. She 100? Almost? Hmm. She's a high ranker. So within rankers, there's like high rankers. So like I, I ranker is, is a very generic term of like people that climb the tower and like really OP. Like Leto is a ranker, Quan is a ranker, Yuri's a ranker, but Yuri's a high ranker because this is like, 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 like think of it like this, right? Yuri is challenger in ELO. While you can be a ranker by playing solo queue and being part of the elo system from bronze to fucking challenger, right? There's different elos, and in Yuri's a fucking high ranker, so it's really OP. This was someone who was in the top 1% of all the rankers. Okay. It was this exceptional display of power that allowed her to become the only princess to receive a 13-month series weapon in the past five centuries. 
But what people know her for the most is her vicious temper. That's why many of the other rankers tend to fear her. Now, I suppose that one of the important things to note from this is that rankers and regulars can be centuries of years old. Shinsu Age is a allows concept it? that can be easily manipulated within the tower. So, people <laughs> like Yuriur and Dordesi who look young... What do, you, what do you mean age is something that can be manipulated? Because Shinsu, Shinsu allows you to do whatever you want. ...have actually been alive for hundreds of years. What?! And Dordesi 300 plus? What? What? <laughs> I could see Yuri being that, but Endorsey is? Anyway, when Anak tries to attack after getting called out for being an imposter, her punch is blocked by the lapel pins we saw in the last And we contact. never see that, bro. We never the see that. The conversation didn't end there, though. Anak had a question of her own. She wanted to know who exactly Rachel was. The thing is, Endorsey didn't know either. They just happened to stumble across each other in the deathmatch test. At the time, the big monster-looking guy had already been with Endodice. Then, And I think it's heavily implied that the big monster guy was never an actual person, and simply existed as an extra life for Rachel, because when Rachel got stabbed in the most recent episode we watched, that guy disappeared as well, so it wasn't an actual character. Or maybe it was some kind of contract? I don't know, but he's, he's gone. Kind of sad. And when she came across Rachel, she got this weird feeling that she shouldn't fight her. Not because Rachel was strong or anything like that, but more so because she felt different. She gave off the vibe of someone who lived in a completely different world. I guess you could liken it to how it was when Kun met Bam. The distinct presence that both Rachel oh, and Bam possessed made the ones who met them want to keep them close. Now, three days after the crown game- Is Rachel that special? So far, I haven't seen anything from Rachel that makes me think that she's capable by herself. It seems like she just- Goes around leeching off of different teammates. I'm actually gonna get fucking upset if Rachel gets a power, bro. Cause so far, I, I haven't seen her do shit. She seems to be like a light bearer. But like, she's not really smart, I don't think. She's not strong. She doesn't have friends. What, is, what the fuck does she have? All she have is jealousy and fucking scheming behind the scenes, I think. If Rachel gets a fucking power, fuck I'm gonna be mad. And it is when the position test began. Each of the regulars were assigned a basic position, these being roles that each member of a team would take on if ever fighting a battle. It's a concept that I'm going to discuss in depth in a separate video, so don't worry if right now you're confused as to what those positions we'll mean. We'll watch that later. But anyway, technically the evaluation for the position tests had already been going on. You see, the goal of this test was to gain the most points in the position that you were assigned. Points are given based on a regular's success in their training, as well as the results of their final tests. But what the regulars didn't know was that points had already been given out based on their performance in the previous tests. During those examinations, not only was every regular's viability for each position being assessed, but also their overall potential in it. Extra okay. points were also given to the regular who performed the best in each test. If you were one of the regulars chosen, then you gained the title of best seed for your assigned position. Best so seed. So because there had but already not a regular. been four tests, that means four best seeds had been determined. In the deathmatch test, Rachel's ability to ally with two of the strongest regulars displayed her uncanny charisma. So. Charisma of a fucking rotten apple? You think that Rachel has charisma? Straight up. Honest, genuine conversation right now. Let's go. You guys genuinely think that Rachel has charisma. This depressed, emo, you know, fucking girl that doesn't do anything, that has no communication skills, that has nothing fucking positive about her going on. Like, you, you think so? You think that she has charisma? I think that she got fucking lucky and she's barely fucking surviving by holding on to the clutches of others. Like... She's ugly? Listen, I don't know if she's ugly or not. Okay, that's... That, that's... That, I did an effort! <laughs> what, are you implying that ugly people can't be charismatic? <laughs> that's besides the point! That's besides the point! I'm just saying, in terms of the things that we've seen from Rachel in the show, nothing has hinted that she's a charismatic person that can sway other people to join her side unless it's by kind of going around deceiving people's back, you know, whispering lies in their ears and hoping that they're gonna fucking join out of fucking pettiness. I don't know. I... I... 
I don't think she fucking. I don't think he's charismatic. Clearly, clearly, she can get allies, but I don't think that the way that she gets allies is charismatic. I think that she's simply getting lucky or preying on other people's fucking emoness. Oh, she was considered to be the best performer there, and as such, gained best seat in the light bearer position. I hate this. Why? You think that Rachel is more charismatic than Kun? You think that Kuhn is an inferior light bearer compared to Rachel? I hate this so much. I fucking hate this so much. It's just, oh, 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 how can you, how can you accept this? How could you possibly fucking accept, oh, <laughs> disgusting. Anak displayed a significant level of Shinsu resistance during Lirado's test, so she was given best seed for the fisherman position. Shibisu showcased a high level that. of deductive skills when he yeah. was the only one to perfectly solve yeah. the door test. So, to everyone's surprise, he was given best seed in the scouts. That's crazy. This party right now. Best fisherman, best scout. Hats, what are you doing? Hats is honestly looking kind of lacking right now, if you think about it, right? Because, like... So far, we're led to believe that Hats and Anak are OP and Shibisu is just like an NPC, but I don't know. I got, I got two fucking, you know, first seeds in their respective positions here. Then finally, Kun's affinity for strategy and manipulation was very clearly highlighted in the crown game. Okay, what so role? he also got a best seed for the light bearers. Best seed means only one seed! Put Rachel down! No! I- ugh. Now, here's the full list and rankings of every regular- Alright, let's see this shit. Let us see this shit right here. For the fisherman side, four people. Best seed, Anak and Dorsey. Chun Hua Hong. I have no idea who that is. Dioda. Don't know. Leo Clocker. Don't know. Didi Kancho. Kon Blaru. Who the fuck are these characters? Straight. Who? who why is Hutz not here? Really? All right. Light Bear. Best seed. Kunageto Agnes. Obviously. Best seed. Michelle Light. Fuck you. Michelle Light should not be best seed. There can only be one best seed. Liron 3. Uh, that's Gara. That's Gara, I think. Chung Chung. Who the fuck is Chung Chung? Levin? I don't fucking know. Spear Bearer. Ghost. Uh, is Ghost the big boy? I could see that. Rack Wraith Razor. That's right. That's our boy Rack. Hyun Song. I have no clue. Alexei Amogachar. There's no clue. Eric Bion, Goon, Pitsuru, Inua Yoran. No fucking clue. Scouts. Best seed. Shibisu. Hot is Scout? What? Hot's the swordsman. Hot's the fighter that can keep up with Anak. Hot is a scout? Like Shibisu. If a scout is supposed to be cunning and intelligent and deceptive and manipulating and strategy... Really? You, you guys think that Hatz is a scout role? I, I would have thought that Hatz is an easy fisherman. Oh, okay. Narae Sonwoo. Who the fuck is that? Polygon. No. Katan, Chichi, Baxter, Chopin, Serena, Lin. Oh, we know Serena. We do know Serena, but everyone else, who the fuck are they? And wave controllers. Fonsekar Laure. That's clearly... It. Fonseca gotta be like a crazy family, right? The 10 great families or something. Fonseca gotta be one of them, right? Hwarion. Hwarion is the red-haired girl. Ho. Fuck you, ho. Piece of shit. I'm glad you died. Loziel, no clue. Gray is the, um, like a small goth, goth Lolita kind of looking girl that was in our bag. And Bomb, which is obviously the main character. That, that's us. Where's Paracul, bro? Where, where? I, 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 these are top seeds. These, these are like the best of the best, right? Like, Paracul, where's the spear revolutionaries, bro? Paracul talked all that shit. Where, where, is, where is he, bro? ...and the position that they were assigned to. What the anime didn't mention was that only a limited number of people for each position could pass the final test. Paracul more charismatic than Rachel? I 100% agree. Yes. I kind of fuck with Paracul. He's like a dumbass. Absolutely. The spear revolutionaries, they're a fucking circus. However, I think that... Sometimes there's groups of people that's just so fucking stupid and you expect nothing from them, but they either just get lucky as fuck or they just like do some bullshit that's funny. That's the way that I, th I see the Spear Revolutionaries. They're dumb as fuck, but maybe they can be useful in their own odd way. 
You can see what that limit is by looking yeah, at the number Yeah, falling upwards, exactly. The they fail upwards. Only those who rank the highest with their points at the end will be the ones chosen to pass. It was clear that every point mattered when it came to such a competitive test, especially when attendance was a factor being considered when distributing points. If Baum was to miss any of his classes, then that definitely would have been a detriment to his already low ranking within the wave controllers. Nah, he built different. This was something that Baum was actually concerned about. When he woke up and heard that testing had begun two days earlier, It's fine, our class starts later. He immediately wanted to know if he failed. Yeah. Only after finding out that his classes were delayed did he start to ask about Rachel. That didn't mean that Rachel was secondary though. He still cared more for her than anything the tower could provide. Not only that, but Bum wasn't so naive as to just simply believe the lies that Kun made up. He knew from the beginning that Rachel would try something like this to get up the tower without him. What he just couldn't understand though was why, why the stars were so important. Yeah, why? It was a mutual feeling of misunderstanding that both Bam and Rachel had towards the other. Neither could truly comprehend why the other was going to such lengths to achieve their goals. Just talk. Regardless, Bam wasn't going to let go of Rachel so easily. I hate this. I fucking... This is one of the most annoying things of Tower of God is the way that this fucking dog simps for his master. And Every turn. And yeah, we need character development, right? We need character development so that one day he'll be like, you know what, Rachel? The stars you were looking for, it was me all along. But nope, you can't have me no more. I don't need you. Go away. I hope we get to that point. I swear to God, if we spend the entirety of season one and season two chasing after Rachel. Oh, bro. Please. 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 There has to be character development. There, The author... Must know that it's so infuriating for the audience to see Bomb like this. There's no shot that this is happening so that nothing changes. Like, he must have character development where he realizes value in himself and the people around him rather than chasing for someone that doesn't even give a fuck about him, man. Continuing on with the test now, the first wave controller class gave us a lot of information on Shinsu itself. Yes, it is a godlike power. But more than that, it's pretty much what allows the world to be what it is. It gives the residents of the tower life. It allows them to breathe. And they drink it's what it? constitutes every bit of energy produced. Can they drink it? Because it's Shinsu in its essence is water. I've never seen anyone drink Shinsu before. Yuka made it seem as if nothing was possible without Shinsu. This dude literally looks like a rice ball with fucking shit on the sides. Look at it. Look at it. Rice ball and poop. It's a fucking coiler, bro. One, two, three coils. One, two coils. Two and a half coils, bro. Shinsu. In a way, he could very well be right about that. With Shinsu, anything was possible. You could create light, water, or fire. Manipulate it any way, shape, or form you Can want you to create say, life? You yourself for a god. Of course, something so powerful requires an immense amount of training to control. To put into context how powerful it was, Yuga made it clear that he could use his Shinsu to kill every regular in the room. Oh, his name is Yoga. Okay. Yuga? Yoga. The sub said Yoga, but it sounds like he said Yuga. All within Yuga? no more than five seconds. It's for that reason that a regular required permission from the floor's administrator to be able to manipulate Shinsu themselves. But why could Bomb do it at the end of Crown Game? Because he's not a regular. I know we saw people doing it with the help of an item. Items, it's fine. And Laure already had contract? But using an item to manipulate Shinsu was a different situation. Those items were already approved to do so at the workshop they were built. Workshop so anyone could use those built. items to manipulate Shinsu without permission. There, there, there's a workshop. There's a factory where they create magical items like this that we don't know yet. O okay. Using any more than that required a contract with the administrator. As we saw, contracts were made via the pockets. E-ranked pockets let you make contracts with administrators up to the 40th floor. And then Anything after one? that required a higher ranked pocket. Okay. But considering that Bam had an a rank pocket, that probably won't be too much of an issue. Because Evan gave us that pocket. And we already just skipped everything. I wonder if there's any advantages of that. Now, the contract process itself wasn't too different. The only thing left out was the administrator taking a moment to check if Bam was qualified to control Shinsu. Upon doing so, the administrator gave a brief look of shock. <laughs> what did he say? The, the admin say, 
a monster has arrived. That's like literal. A very short instance of surprise that would have made the line about the contract you. being a shackle make more sense. Right. You said that this contract is more of like a burden for you than me. He's like, you know, you're going to be like restrained by this. Because he could already use it before. And now with the contract, he is, the amount of Shinsu he can use is limited because of the contract. Is that the implication here? Because like in the crown game, his golden Shinsu outburst was like, whoa, he don't need no admin for that. But now with the contract, maybe he's limited. I don't know. After this, we have an interaction involving Ho, Bam, and Lore that was completely changed. Ho there sucks. wasn't anything about being exhausted or Ho putting up a facade to make it seem as if he was better than Bam. Oh? Instead, Ho seemed as if he was genuinely trying to help Bam out. Damn, the anime just made him look so evil for no reason then. Understanding how Shinsu worked wasn't something that was so easily done. Besides, huh. knowledge itself wasn't good enough to make someone proficient at controlling it. The key to Shinsu manipulation lied in a person's talent, and Ho was certain that Bam was talented enough to excel at it. What? That's when Ho showed Bam the limits of his own talent. All he could do was muster up a single ball of Shinsu. It, the anime made him to be such a fucking antagonist, being so jealous and scheming, you know? But the webtoon is like, nah, Ho was just a nice guy, and he just wanted to be friends with Bam. It wasn't anything special, and certainly not practical enough to use in combat. Even Laurie agreed that Ho's placement into the wave controller position was a little bit surprising. I mean, Laurie was- That's- that's a- that's a fucking indirect insult right there. ...was already well aware of the full extent of Ho's potential. And unfortunately, it very clearly wasn't anything close to talent. Damn. As Bam heard this, he tried to make Ho feel better. Surely there must be something Ho could use to show his talents. But just to further highlight the stark contrast between them, Lowry quickly teaches Bam to do the exact same skill that Ho just displayed. He told Bam to imagine Feel the world different. itself gathering as a circle in his hand. Sure enough, merely moments after being instructed on how to do it, Bam was able to he replicate just do Ho's it. skill. He did even something even more crazy. He just copied what Quant said. Quant was like, submerge the student Shinsu, and Bam was like, boom, and Quant's like, what the fuck? He actually did it! That's exactly what talent was. And that, something about talent, something about just either being born with talent or not is such an unfair topic, right? But at the same time, it's so compelling. It's either of like, you're either born with it or you're not. And no matter what kind of work you put into, you can never overcome this, you know, lack of talent. You either have it or you don't. A part of it, when I watch shows or stories where they kind of um, reiterate these themes, it makes me feel like, damn, that kind of sucks. It's like, it's so unfair. But then the other side of it, it's like the unfairness almost makes it even more compelling because it's so unique. You either have it or you're not. It's complete luck. But something about it, even if it seems unfair, a part of me is like, damn, could I be lucky? Would I be talented? Stuff like that gets in my head whenever they start talking about, you know, talent and whether or not you just have it or don't. This was a pretty big deal because learning any particular skill with Shinsu takes years and years of practice. This was the first scene to highlight just how much potential Bam possessed. It also gives us a different portrayal of Ho's character. Ho really was trying to be Bam's friend. Only after realizing how big the gap between them really was does he start to become envious. Yeah, that's the part where he turns and I guess the anime was like, you know what, let's just make him envious from the beginning rather than just like making it seem like he might be a good person. Next, we get to the Spear Bears class. Unlike in the anime, Rack was initially very confident that he could hit the target. Yeah? But that confidence soon turned to embarrassment as he missed his shot completely. No! It was a feeling that only became worse when the big guy from Rachel's team hit the Ghost. target right after. Ghost. And just to highlight how big this guy really is, here's Rack's height in comparison. Holy Switching back shit. to the dorms now. What is that guy? I, I thought we're gonna get any fucking explanation on what this guy is, man. What an enigmatic fellow. He just shows up, said absolutely nothing. Seems so scary. Ate a shitload of chocolate with Rack, had a fun time. And then he disappeared when Rachel got stabbed. To make it seem like he was an extra life for Rachel. Someone that never existed. Just like a ghost. His name. Switching back to the dorms now. Shibisu and Hats were trying to get 10 friends to sign for their scout test. As tensions were rising between Hats and Kun, Shibisu tries to de-escalate the situation yeah, by having the two get to know each other. 
So Kun decided to be all arrogant and introduce himself as the son of a noble family. Almost as if he was trying to use his family name to make he himself is, appear better than Huts. It was rather odd behavior for someone who was usually so composed. And it's what made Huts respond with the comment about his earrings. Which, for the record, is apparently a big trend where Kun grew up. <laughs> the Agueros, no, so the Kun family loves earrings? Phone earrings, shrimp earrings, butterfly earrings, dog earrings, ship earrings. They, they, just, they just love the earrings over the Kun family, huh? Shibisu then gets Huts to give his own introduction. We learn that Huts is only 18 years old and grew up the son of a swordsmith. Finally, someone that does not abuse Shinsu to hide their fucking age. They're 18. This makes sense. And Dorsey, 300 plus. Now Anak calling and Dorsey Baba or something? A hag? And wasn't Endorsey calling Serena a hag? Hold the fuck up! Hold the fuck up! Serena doesn't have Shinsu control. Serena can't make herself look young with Shinsu. She's limited. She's probably late 20s, early 30s, I don't know. And Dorsey is 300 plus years old. But she has Shinsu makeup. So her calling Serena a hag. What the fuck? What a hypocrite. What an absolute narcissistic hypocrite. The whole seppuku comment that we see in the anime was Kun just trying to make fun of Hatsu's family's old style traditions. The two just kept going back and forth with each other. They clearly weren't planning on becoming friends. They're like oil and Only water. Only after Bam talks about his own past does Kun change his mind. Bam's story of never having a family or place to call home made Kun recall what Rachel said about Bam being this lonely boy. He had lived his entire life alone. So now that he finally had the opportunity to change that, Kun felt he shouldn't be the one to prevent it. After this, there was a panel with Rack that I wasn't in. Just I hate, I hate this shit. I hate this shit. Kun needs to fucking let. And like, even Endorse is going around saying stuff like, yo, you know, Rachel doesn't like you. This is like, you should stop this. Like, notice me. I'm literally here. You're just ignoring me. And Bomb is probably gonna fucking create a harem of girls that chase after him while he chases after Rachel. And that's the worst fucking part, man. After this, there was a panel with Rack that I wasn't entirely sure how to interpret. Training? I don't know if he's sneaking in or sneaking out is or sneaking even out? just training himself by climbing. But whatever it is, I think I'll just leave it for you guys to try to figure out. Now, You're right. the scene where Rachel has the dream with Bomb. You're absolutely right that it's, it's not Rachel's fault that he's so clingy. Well, you could make the argument that... You, you made him so dependent on you, like almost like a newborn animal, you know, seeing the first thing they see, it's like their mom and they treat it like that. But I do agree. I think that it's not Rachel's fault that he's so fucking clingy. And, and that part's fucking cringe. That, that's why it's like, I hate Rachel for being so moody and gloomy and, and fucking not telling us shit and being fucking all, all depressing. But then I hate the fact that Bam also fucking just keeps simping and can't recognize this. That's the worst fucking part. And now it's like, but... In order for character development to happen, like, obviously you need to start somewhere. I just hope that this is not going to be a repeating theme. Like, I swear to God, if this shit is all of season two content, it lasts into fucking season three content. It's like, oh, fuck, what? You're going to make me fucking wait 500 chapters for Bam to then realize his own value and the people around him rather than chasing after someone that he never, like, that they never even cared about? I just, I don't know when that development is going to happen, but I imagine... This is one of the one of the things that a lot of people watching Tower of God get so fucking frustrated about, right? Wasn't supposed to take place in the cave that they came from, but rather beneath an open night sky filled with stars. Normally, this wouldn't be something that I'd point out, but I think that the imagery used here was meant to show contrast between the two most important things in Rachel. Oh, the anime scene was him just in like a lighted section and her in like a shadow, but he is like the stars right now. Rachel's life. In the webtoon, at first Rachel was by herself enjoying the night sky. Remember, Rachel has mentioned that her dreams are always overwhelmed by the beautifully blinding lights of the stars. Why? Yet, here she it's was dreaming stars. of them yet again, only to have their light be dwarfed out by bombs. It's as if the more friends Bam made, the brighter he shone. And that seemed to ruin what was once Rachel's perfect dream. How? How? You, you, like, your, your sky is just... 
What? Wh how does bomb having friends prevent you from chasing after your own star? That sounds like there's only fucking one star, the sky. And if bomb exists, she can't have the fucking sky. Like, why is this mutually exclusive? It's like shit. Bomb's getting friends. Fuck. Should be me, goddammit. I should be there instead. Is that? That's the only conclusion we can make, right? Like. I don't think that the stars, the fucking sky, is so small that simply bomb thriving, you know, prevents her from enjoying her dream. So it must mean that she's a jealous bitch that wishes that she was bomb and could have these, you know, you know, talented people all around her and just be the main character. Is she just upset that she's not the fucking main character of the show? When what was once Rachel's perfect dream, something else was now brighter than that once unbeatable glow of the stars. Bitch! Stop looking at him and look at the other inside of the sky and at the center of it was bam it's a scene in which this comparison can only be made if the stars are there but for some reason the anime decided not to include it next time, i mean the whole the whole theme of just like them walking away with bum just kind of shows like that rachel has abandonment issues too is that why she cut off bum before bum could leave rachel is this the one thing that she's afraid of the most one day this boy that's clinging on to him will realize his worth and just walk away and then rachel will be finally alone and that's why she'd rather be alone right now is, or is that what we're doing the anime decided not to include it next we have the cafeteria scene where we get to learn a bit more about best girl and Dorisi. unlike in the anime she wasn't the one who made the initiative to try to sit with all the oh? others in fact she found it rather weird that competing rivals would hang out together she would have sat on her own had she not taken Bam's meal on accident. When she went to go switch it, it was Bam who insisted that they eat together, mm. an offer that she found very difficult to refuse. So while at the table, the current conversation was about how Hut still needed to find two more people to be his friend. She be so chill. As you'd expect, Bam's first thought was to just ask Endodacy. The way Bam put it made it seem as if he was trying to put the two on a date, to which Endodacy had to decline since it was something her family didn't allow. Even if did her family not allow it? Or it's just a contract, right? It's like the Zahad thing. Oh, also, I just realized. Her hairpin here. If you look at her hairpin, it's three eyes. It's the Zahad hairpin, I, I guess. But yeah, if you're a Zahad princess, you're a, you're a shoe. You're basically a premium shoe. Like a PSA 10 Pokemon card. It can never come out of the packaging. It can never leave the original box. You are a toy, limited mint condition toy. You put in the package and nothing can touch you. Even if it was just to be friends, platonic relationships between guys and girls wasn't something that she believed in. And that was pretty much the end of that. Anyway, rather than get- Yeah, and she continues to advance onto Bam. Maybe she's gonna break the forbidden bow and do something. Getting only halfway through the fisherman test, I think here would be a good place to stop. All right. right now the anime is still managing to cover- No, no, but the- I don't know what he's talking about, but we're not gonna take any chances. We already know about Anak. We're very ahead right now. We're on episode 9. This is episode 6 cut content. But guys, please go to Mr. Annie News' channel. Like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And we're, don't worry. We will continue Tower of God. Like, I have all the episodes ready. I'm just going to release them in a, in a way such that it lines up perfectly into season 2. And we will hit the ground running as soon as season 2 content's out. Don't worry.